for the time. This is tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome back to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back. I was here this afternoon with the incredible Audrey Gale, and she got to share a little bit on her book called The Human Trial. So check that out. Uh, you can check out that Tea Time on the YouTube channel and all podcast apps out there and stations. So tonight, I want to get you guys over to the YouTube channel, ring that little doorbell and subscribe, and you will be able to see over 300 plus interviews from all walks of life from all different countries. Uh, if there's not one Tea Time that resonates with you, I guarantee you there's another one that will. And that's how Miss Liz works. I try to get all different topics out there. So tonight, I have the incredible Marie Powell in, in the house, and we're going to be talking about her latest book. Uh, last of the gifted spirit sites. So we're going to be talking about that book. We're going to be talking about her tea. Her tea is respect, explore, attitude, lifelong learning. I did get the attitude in there, Marie, as uh, we, we, we talk back and forth. So a little bit about uh, Marie and disclaimer, and then we're going to spill some tea with all of you guys. So please enjoy. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any show and Tea Time hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of the giving time of airing. guests and audience participants for some where they may be emotionally at risk it is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutic advice if you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion you may freely contact me miss liz through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all Tea Time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If it's not a Thursday, it is a rescheduled Tea Time, a surprise Tea Time, or a special Tea Time because Miss Liz does all of that as well. So now a little bit about my guest. Well, who is my guest? Well, Marie Powell is an author of young adult fantasy, including the last of the gifted series with spirit sight and water sight to date. She is the author of more than 40 books with such publishers as School Schoolistic Education Canada, Am Amicus Publication, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, Crabtree and Learner, Lightning Bolt. She's hold a, she holds a master's in fine arts MFA degree in creative writing from the University of British Columbia. Marie's award-winning short story and poetry appears in such literature magazines as the Sunlight Press, Subterrain Room, and Transition. She is also a professional writer and editor with articles in more than 70 prints online and the broadcast markets. Marie lives on Treaty 4 land in Virginia, Virginia, Saskatchewan, I'm not saying that right, and her writing workshops are popular across the region. For more information or reviews, please contact her publicist, Mickey Mickelson from Creative Edge, who has given me Marie tonight to have some tea together. So let me get Marie in here and let's spill some tea together. Welcome, Marie. Hi. Nice Hi. to be here. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, you know, my, my tongue, sometimes it slips and I can't pronounce something. And I'm just like, I know I'm not saying it right. Uh, you know, and I'm from Canada too, and I should know how to say it. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but many people, you know, I mean, uh, the name, the Regina, many people say Regina, cause that's how you say the woman's name, Regina, right? Yeah. Uh, or the Latin term, which means queen, I think, but, uh, but we say Regina, I don't know. It's probably a Saskatchewan thing. <laughs> well, 
my biggest thing, Marie, is the way that I pronounce words is by the letters I see. And yeah. the silent letters give me a struggle all the time. Right. So it's just like, oh, okay, yeah. what are we doing with these letters? Right. Mm. <laughs> so, Marie, I'm going to take you back until you were a little girl. So, who was Marie when she was little? And who is Marie now as a grown woman? Oh, gee. Well, I guess when I was little, I was, uh, you know, pretty much telling stories to my next door neighbor. That's actually the very first memory I have of. Um, reading or write. I have a few memories of reading and writing. Initially, I remember the moment I learned how to read um, in my grade one class when my teacher pointed to the word uh, cat with a picture of a cat on the board. And I went, ah, oh, cat connection, right? <laughs> it was like from then on. <laughs> but, uh, but I had a next door neighbor who used to babysit me and uh, Mrs. Lowe. Thank you, Eva Lowe, wherever you are. Anyway, um, she, uh, she, I, I sat down one day and wrote, um, you know, the way that kids do they stapled papers together and, and colored in a book. And then I told her what the story was all about. And uh, it was actually quite a moralistic tale about, uh, I was desperate, I am actually quite afraid of bugs. Uh, so I have kind of a fascination with insects and things like that. I'm trying to write stories about them too for kids. But uh, at that time, I was desperately afraid of bees and wasps and things. So I wrote a story about a bee that kept stinging people until people turned around and stung it. And that was back before I realized how good bees were, you know. So, I mean, you learn things on, along the way, right? But um, Mrs. Lowe was, uh, was quite the figure in, uh, in my early childhood in terms of storytelling. And now mostly I write. I mean, I, I do enjoy reading um, out loud. Um, reading my, my books and, you know, uh, and I really like audiobooks. I like to listen. I guess that's the Welsh in my background. Um, supposedly w people from Wales can sing, right? Or harmonize or whatever. I think it's just a, a, a sense of being attuned to audio, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's, I think I'm, I don't know if I'm very much different than I was at four or five or six in there somewhere. But um, yeah, I like to think I've grown up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Marie, how old were you when you started writing? Oh, when I got published for when I started writing, like I said, I, I think I've been writing all along. But really, my first um, book publication was when I was 40, 45, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had newspaper articles and, you know, magazine articles and things like that published before that, but nothing in fiction. Um, until I was in my mid to late forties. Yeah. So what got you into the fiction? Um, I think I always wrote it. Uh, the story that was first, my very first publication, my first story um, actually sat in a box, box in my basement for 10 years. I wrote mm -hmm. it during a class that I had taken in the, in the early nineties. And during the critique of the class, there were like, I don't know, 11 or 12 of us in the group and the instructor, and, you know, everyone had the usual pleasant, you know, comments to make and, and suggestions and things like that. And even the instructor, you know, was was pretty reasonable. And then one person in the group said, I don't think this is a short story. I think it's a character sketch. And so I went, oh, it's a character sketch because, you know, the only thing you ever hear as a writer is the negative comments. Right. Yeah. And so I. <laughs> in a box and thought, well, I don't know how to, I don't know how to make it a story, a short story. I'll just leave it in a box for a while and figure out what I'm doing. And the box got moved into the basement and, you know, forgotten about. And then I saw uh, there, a call for a mag little magazine here in Saskatchewan called Transition Magazine that pays for submissions, you know, so I thought that was legit. And it was about, I guess, 2004 in there. And I, um, I, I, noticed in the call that it kind of fit it made me think of that story for some reason but it also um berna barclay was the editor of that magazine at the time she's an order of Can she was an order of canada writer um she's passed on now but very influential for many of us here in saskatchewan and she had written in the call that she would give feedback to everyone who and who submitted <laughs> so i went oh well if somebody can tell me how to turn this Thing into a story into a short story it'll be Berna so because I mean we knew her vaguely you know from different 
activities that had gone on here and readings and things like that. So I uh, packed it up and sent it off to her and thought, you know, I'll get feedback and it'll be good, right? Well, she got 200 entries, but she gave everybody feedback just like she said she, said she would. So that must have been massive. Uh, anyway, she um, wrote back to me a letter and the opening line of it was, I love your short story and I want to publish it. So that was a shocker, you know, because I thought it was a character sketch at that point because one person out of, you know, 15 had said that. Anyway, like I said, you always hear the negatives, right? Yeah. More than you hear the positives. And, uh, but that was the first thing I had published. And then I, I submitted to a call with Scholastic Education and had a, a wonderful, wonderful experience with a nonfiction uh, book for kids called uh, Dragonflies Are Amazing. Uh, everybody loves dragonflies, you know, it's my, it's my uh, sort of talisman now, the dragonfly, but um, I went through, um, you know, the usual editing process and whatnot with a, a major publisher like that. And it was amazing. It was great. And the book that, that they came out with is gorgeous. It's a beautiful little book that's still in print today. And um, it has, uh, you know, really colorful pictures it's kind of geared to helping reluctant readers learn how to read which yeah. fits my profile really well because what I I do in my other with my other hat on <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> many hats right yes I have many hats but one of my hats is to teach English as a second language or as an additional language as we say here and um, and I worked in a library as a programmer for 15 years and one of the th lovely things about doing programming at a library is mostly you're doing it for young children and it's all about learning how to read, you know? So, uh, so that fit really well for me. Yeah. So were you that in like that librarian that would out read the stories? The little yes. Books? That's why I, I think that's what, what got me into children's books really. Um, Cause I, I wrote whatever, you know, poetry, whatever, when I was younger. Um, but I, I started writing children's books, partly because I took a class in children's writing with uh, wonderful Alison Lohans from here in Regina. She's uh, a really lovely person and a very good mentor teacher type person and also an excellent, I think she has something like 30 um, or more you know, books for children of all ages, you know, up to up from preschoolers right through till uh, sort of middle grade and young adult. And um, anyway, I took a class with her, but but also partly because at that time I was working with the the library and reading books to kids. That's I mean the best the best um, learning process for writing is reading, right? Yeah. And since I was reading all these great children's books to you know kids three or four times a week and going into schools and doing it more, <laughs> you know, it just seems like a, it seemed like a natural progression to go in that direction with my writing. So yeah. So Marie, what book stood out to you that you didn't write that you loved reading to the children? Oh, um, oh, so many, you know. Um, oh, now that you've said that, I, I can't think of any. But I, I we, we read five books every session for sure. And we did, um, you know, uh, finger plays and old nursery rhymes and felt stories and all kinds of things. I remember um, felt stories. I, I really like the five, six year olds, the learning to read section, you know, of, of when they're when they're actually doing that activity, learning how to read and um, telling stories. Right. I used to have these in incredible. The woman I worked with um, was a very good programmer and she was very artistic and she could do these great drawings on felt. So we had all these really great felt stories and one of them was, you know, here's three pieces of felt. If you were going to tell a story about this, how would you arrange these pieces on the board? And the kids would come up and, you know, put the pieces in and tell the story. And it would be things like that, the, the way a frog goes from a tadpole to a frog or, you know, the, the flower going from a seed to a flower, that type of thing. So sequencing the, the story. And kids are great at that. And it was really fun to hear their versions of the different, you know, um, that's a, see, it sounds like a really simple story, but you, you yeah. put it with a five or six year old and you get some amazing story with all kinds of character in it and, you know, different types of flowers and different types of, and in, there was one with, uh, with a butterfly, of course, becoming, you know, a cocoon becoming a butterfly kind of thing. 
uh, a caterpillar cocoon butterfly you know that type of thing right uh, well that brings yeah. back a lot of good memories those felt stories yeah i was gonna say and that makes me think of one you know, the eric carl story about the hungry little caterpillar was one that we used to read all the time and um there's one about uh oh jan brett um wrote a story about a mitten um that gets filled with animal a, a mitten that gets left out in the snow by a kid, you know, from oh. the uh, grandmother knits a mitten and the kids le leaves it out in the snow and all these animals come and get into it as the, as the snow is falling and the mitten stretches and stretches and stretches. And we used to act that out with them. We had a big piece of white fabric and we would, back in the day before COVID, you know, when, uh, when you didn't have to worry about um, social distancing quite so much, but um, we, we would get this big piece of fabric and unroll it and unroll it and get all the kids, you know, to come be the different animals getting into the mitten. And then, of course, at some point, somebody sneezes and the mitten goes flying and the animals all fall out. And, oh, they loved it. You know, we used to do things like that all the time. So it was it was more like a, a, a improv improvisational acting or something than it was like reading, really. <laughs> I don't even know if they're still doing felt stories. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Cause COVID, you know, changed all that. We used to use puppets and all kinds of things and they can't do that now in our library. Um, they can't use the hand, the fabric hand puppets, you know, cause of the possibility of, you know, yeah. they just don't allow that anymore. They don't allow fabric and that in, in the, the mix, I don't think. So well, uh, yeah. I wonder if any homeschooling parents are using those felt stories. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. That's a good question. But uh, it was a lot of fun to do that kind of thing. You can do it without fabric, I think. You could just, we used to, if I forgot the piece of fabric, we used to do it anyway. And just, I would just do it with my, you know, you know rolling it out, rolling it out, you know. <laughs> and the kids would all come and sit in a little <laughs> huddle and then go flying when it came time to go flying too. So it's not necessarily that you have to have fabric, but it is kind of a, a fun way to do it. And you could do, you know, um, maybe a piece of felt on the back of a piece of paper, have the, the drawing on a piece of paper, you know, or something, or piece, even a piece of plastic, colored mm -hmm. plastic, like you could draw on it and uh, cut it out and use that, I suppose, and stick that up against magnetic things, maybe a magnet instead of a fabric. <laughs> yeah, right? I think there's ways around it. There's always ways around these things, right? There's always solutions. Yes, there's always yeah. solutions if you yeah. allow it, yeah. So Marie, uh out of your 40 children's book, what which one do you uh, recommend the most? Oh, all of them, you know, because they're they're really good. Like they're all they're all uh, I did 35 books uh, that are in series of six. I'm uh, 30. Wait a minute. That's got to be 36 books then. Right. And anyway, whatever the number is, 30 some books that are um, series of six that are geared to uh, teaching kids how to read. And um, my dragonflies are amazing. Like I said, I always show that one because it's still in print and it's one of my favorites still. Still, you know, I, I have it on my website. You can see the, the very first book, I think, in the, and the one that they say in the um, copy is my favorite is, is dragonflies are amazing. Still one of my favorites, but I love them all. They're all great. I worked on uh, those series with Amicus uh, publishing with um, a wonderful editor, Jenna Giesner, and we worked with Amy Cartwright, the um, illustrator from the U.S., who um, did all, all kinds of really great groups of children playing at different in, in some of the different stories. These, these stories are like 100 words long, but they're very carefully chosen 100 words. It takes a, a fair bit of effort to write a good beginning reader that, that makes the kids want to read. Yeah. And I've had really good response to those. At one point, I was at a, you know, you do these book sales as an author, right? And it's kind of... I'll be honest with you, it's it's often disheartening a little bit because nobody ever buys books from authors at these book sales, right? They come and they look and they wander off, you know, and it's like, it's like you're sitting there going, please buy a book. But um, <laughs> anyway, the one at the one sale I was at, or, or event, I guess it was, it was, there were tables all of different kinds of craftspeople all over the place. And it was in a community hall here. And I was asked to come in as the local writer, you know, like, and so I had my children's books sitting out there. That was before these book before these books, the Last of the Gifted series, that's a young adult series, but these other ones were children's books. Anyway, I had them set out and this dad came over with, you know, his kids in tow, a couple of little, little toddler type kids in tow. And he looked at the books and the one kid picked the book up and asked him if he would read it. And he said, 
do you know, do you mind if I, and I said, no, no, sit down, read, read it. That's great. You know, that's what they're for. Right. So he sat down with the kids and he started reading and another little kid came over from somewhere and another little kid came over from somewhere and all over the hall, these, uh, he had about, in the end, he had about 10 kids there and he read them all of my, you know, ended up being the reader and read them all of the books. Nobody bought any, but, <laughs> but it was a great afternoon because all these kids, like, it was interesting to see that he started reading and then the minute he started reading all these kids started to come you know from all over the all over the hall wherever they were and who's ever parents i don't know where the parents were but the kids all came <laughs> and eventually the parents came too i guess and uh, you know stood around and watched but it was it was really fun to see that you know that's like they're all books that are designed by tradition they're traditional publishing i don't publish my own but um, the, the editors and the publishers do such a good job with educational books of making them attractive, especially the ones that are geared to reluctant readers, you know, and minor accelerated readers, those the 30 some that I did were in an accelerated reading program. So the whole job of that is to get the kids interested, to get the kids engaged and make them want to learn to read, you know, and be excited a little bit about reading. And well, I the, think it's really you know, cool because it is hard to sell books. Anybody yeah. that's written a book, it is hard. A lot of people come and check the table. They see yep. what the book's about. Then the, I'll be back, but they never come back. Well, and they're not cheap. You know, books are not cheap. Like the books, the, these books, they're, um, I can't even get them for, you know, inexpensive prices. Like it costs me to bring them in and then I have to pay shipping to the U.S. and so on. You know, so I, I mean, I, I'd be giving them away, right? You know, if I sold them for too little. But the one place that does buy them is schools and libraries. Like I, I would just walk in with a set of the six and I, you know, put them on the desk at the school and say, if you'd show this to your teacher librarian, here's my invoice. You know, if they want it, um, happy, you can just send me the check basically. And if they don't want it, I'll pop back in and pick it up. Right. And they always sold. I almost never had to go back. I don't think I ever had to go back and pick them up. Um, you know, basically they sold themselves. Right. <laughs> So to schools and libraries, it's easy, but that's, I mean, they have kind of like a budget for that, right? Whereas, um, sorry, that's my, I don't know if you heard that or not, but my doorbell just rang, just ignore it. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, it was, it, it's, it's, um, it was very easy in terms of the market that it actually yeah. exists for them. Like, a, like I say, it's hard to get parents and grandparents um, to buy library bound books, you know, because they're a little more expensive to begin with. And, um, but you know, uh, schools and libraries are what they're intended for. And there, they seem to sell quite well and quite easily. So I've done a lot of readings through schools and libraries. Yeah. Well, I think it's important I get them in the libraries, right? We don't. Oh, talk me about too. Them yeah, yeah, definitely. And we in Canada are so lucky with the public lending, right? I mean, the, the whole, um, you know, fact that that um, people here, authors here are supported by the public lending right. So that if we get our books into different libraries, the government takes a look across the country once a year um, and sees where, where books are. If you register your books, they'll look for them in the different libraries. And if they find them, they give you a small royalty you know, for it. So, I mean, that's incredibly valuable. That kind of support to an author is twofold, right? Because it gives you a shot in the arm, you know, it's like, Yes, yeah. your books are out there and people are reading them and we like that, you know, uh, and and the second is a little bit of money, which always helps. Right. But it also gives quality family time, right, to go to the libraries together and yeah. read yeah. because the parents can buy, can, can pull out the books that they enjoy and the children can pull out the books that they enjoy. And um, yeah, they, and there's in and well, I just taught actually I just taught Sage Hill writing experience for teens here in Regina. Um, that's an amazing program for both adult and teen writers. Um, but the one that I taught here was a face-to-face -face in our public library, in my local library here, Glen Elm Library, which is uh, small, you know, it's in a, a, a suburb, like a, a sort of a, a, you know, suburb, I guess you could say, of Regina that's kind of low income in a way. And, um, the library itself is gorgeous. It's got these big, beautiful windows letting the sunlight in. It's got all these comfortable spaces all around that, you know, and the one day that we were there, the one morning, the library was actually closed, but there was staff in the library. So they said we could, you know, 
go in and look around, right? They gave us a little tour of the library and so on. And everybody in the group, we had 11 writers, 11 young writers so between 13 and 17, 13 and 17, yeah, in the group. And everybody found a spot in the library and sat and wrote for a little while. It was really cool, you know, like yeah. very quietly, you know, everybody in their own sort of, and a couple of them together in the window seat at the at the window and, you know, a couple others curled up in the big chair. And so on. it was like really cool to see that and to see them making themselves at home in the in a public space like that. Like it's, they, they say, here, the sort of slogan, I guess, is to have a welcoming space. And I think the library is here. We have nine branches in oh, Regina. Wow. Regina is not a big city. It's like, you know, 220,000 or something like that. We're not we're not huge, you know, uh, but we have nine branches of the library. And I hope they all stay open because they're so useful for people. Both my, my ESL adult students, you know, um, because our libraries also have books specifically designed for ESL readers, adult adult readers who don't want to read kids' books, you know, who want to read yeah. some, like a, a, a minor, a small novel, something like that. And someday I'm going to write one of those. That's what I would like to do someday. Just oh, it's, because, on your, it's on your bucket list. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, Marie, how did you get into the youth writing? The youth? Um, well, uh how did I? Hmm. I guess because my kids grew older and I wanted, you know, I started reading books when I read to them until they were quite old, 12 or 13. But also um, then I read books that they were reading, you know, just so that I was kind of up on what was going on and so on. I know a lot of children's writers as well. There's a couple of organizations that I'm in that really help with um giving you ideas as a writer about what you might write or different age groups you might write for or how to write for different age groups. One of them is Canscape, right? The Canadian C-A-N-S Society of, <laughs> trying to think of the, the acronym, but it's the Canadian Society of Children's Authors, Illustrators, and Performers. So I think it is. Canscape, excellent group. Um, there's the um, Society of Children's authors and illustrators, which I'm always saying is squibby. I'm not sure how you say it in, in the States, right? There's that group as well that are geared for children's writers. Children's writers, in spite of, you know, Harry Potter, most children's writers don't make the big bucks. You know, <laughs> it's like, um, like I say, kids books are often the market actually is schools and um, libraries more than it is people that would buy books in the way that people buy bestsellers and things like that, right? So there's a notable exceptions like the Velveteen Rabbit and you know Harry Potter that will live forever and all that kind of stuff. But most, there's a wealth of children's books that are excellent books, really well done, really well put together, beautiful books that are just books, you know, like you know, you know about them when you have kids and after your kids grow up, you kind of forget, you know, because you don't go back and read those, right? But, um, but yeah, being in being in organizations, I think, helped me a lot. Being the library programmer, too, because, of course, there I was working with kids of all different ages. I did my preschool and toddler time. And, and um, you know, I, I started a group just for the five to six-year-olds for a few years that was we called Kinder Story Time. And um, then the middle grade groups, you know, we had several sort of craft and book-based programs going on. And then we had the young adults at that time. And we had young adult um, uh, advisory committees where we'd get kids from the schools, try and recruit them in to, you know, tell us what they wanted and all that kind of stuff. So that was useful for me when I first wanted to. They, they, they are very good at giving suggestions for what they are reading too. You know, the kids in my advisory group were always telling me, oh, you got to read this one. And I'd read these books and go, oh, I love this. I have to write this. You know, I, I'm one of those people. I don't write because I can't find what I'm looking for or something. I, I write because I, I'm inspired by really good writers and I want to be one, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where my effort goes, you know. Um, so, so how did you get this series started? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'm Welsh in background, right? And um, my grandfather was a Welsh speaker. But basically, by the time I was born, I'm the last in my family. Um, they, my grandparents were um, already passed on by the time I was, you know, born, basically. And 
when I was a kid and you do those activities in school where the teachers tell you, you know, find out about your grandparents, interview your grand. Yeah, I had no grandparents to interview because they were gone. Right. <laughs> so uh, but I was always really that I think that made me kind of fascinated by them. So anyways, when I was in my 40s, <laughs> I uh, decided I'd better go to Wales and find out, you know, what it really was all about, because I've been fascinated with it all my life. Right. So um, I had the opportunity to take my kids with me. And we went um, to Wales on a, just a kind of a family holiday. And we were touring the different castles because, you know, Wales is known for having 400 and some castles in ruins all over the place. It's a little teeny tiny country, too. Like you could fit it in the far west section of, of Saskatchewan around Cypress Hills. It would fit right in there. It's little, you know, compared to like and Saskatchewan is the small province. Uh, you know, I mean, PEI is the really small province, but basically we're a pretty small prairie province. Uh, and, you know, it's like a tenth of the size of Saskatchewan. So it was like, anyway, we decided we'd go and, and we were looking at all these different castles. And as we were touring them, I realized that they weren't Welsh castles. They were created by Edward I, the big ones, the Conwy and Beaumaris and uh, Carnarvon, the ones that we were going to visit. And I had bought all these tickets, right? Like you buy um, a ticket for seven days or whatever, you can go to umpteen different castles. So um, I thought, well, I wonder if there were castles, the Welsh princes, you know, because you hear about these Welsh princes or were some at some point there were Welsh princes. Right. And we happened to be staying on a sheep farm at Dolwith Helen in northern Wales in Gwynedd. And um, just beside where we were, about five kilometers down the road was this great big ruin uh, called Dolwith Helen Castle. And so we thought we'd drive over there and see what that was all about, you know looked big so we you could see it from the highway so we thought we'd go in and we got in there and like when we had gone to the big Carnarvon Conwy and those other castles there were people everywhere like there it was big you know tour it's sort of a tourist thing there were guides to you know you could buy a guided tour of it you could get a, a an audio tour you know or whatever and do it yourself you could uh, there was a little gift shop and you know all that right but when we got to Dolwith Allen Castle, there was nobody there at all. We were the only car in the parking lot. There was nobody to take my ticket. I had tickets, but there was nobody to take them. <laughs> so we were like, oh, this is weird, you know. And there were all these signs, right, that were like people falling off of rocks. It was kind of like, enter at your own risk, right? You know, that kind wow. of we're, like, we're like, oh, where are we? <laughs> anyway, it was gorgeous countryside, though, like a beautiful waterfall and, you know, a gorgeous hill, like mountainside, basically, where you're going up and this great big fortressy looking black, you know, tower at the top of it. So we climbed up, you know, and we went in to the area where it is like, it's not fenced or anything. It's just a, a bunch of old ruins, really. <laughs> Anyway, we, we went in there and um, we the first thing we saw was the entrance was way up, like on what would be to me the first floor, you know, the first story up kind of thing. It wasn't at the bottom where you kind of expect to go in somewhere. So we're looking at that going, oh, that's interesting. And there was this kind of stone step thing leading up to it. So we went up and we went in and there were kind of placards, like big postery things set here okay. and there around the main floor telling you, you know, the diff the, about how the Welsh lived at that time and all that it was very, it was kind of like the old style self-guided tour where you were actually reading the little placards, you don't have the, you know, <laughs> earphones in and you don't hear the wonderful actors acting it out and all that. Anyway, so we were walking around reading these and realizing like in that castle, it's all a big sort of one big room. And I guess everybody slept together, you know, the men on one side of the room and the women on the other side of the room. And there was a hearth there that would have been the, the stove with the um, like the kitchen, little tiny kitchen area sort of beyond beyond it. But the the stove to hearth, whatever, the the furnace, essentially, that isn't a furnace, you know, like the wood burning thing um, was right there that would have heated this. And, stone castles are chilly you know anyway it was it was all kind of one big room there was an upstairs and as you went upstairs there was a battlement around it and all that we were reading about um the history of my city the first nations history in regina is that uh for a period of time 
the First Nations were told they couldn't come into Regina or they could come in, but they had to leave at 5 p.m. or whatever. And they had, if they were going to sleep overnight, they had to be in the ex where the exhibition grounds are now. And, you know, it was very restricted and all of this, right? And they couldn't speak their own language and many other things. And we were reading the placards and it was the same in Wales. In 1282, they lost a war. And by 1284, there were all these restrictions and the Welsh couldn't stay in the town overnight and they couldn't speak their own language. They couldn't do business in their own language with real threats like their tongues would be cut out, whatever, things like that. And um, this went on basically for a few hundred years there, you know, and we were looking at that going, wow, because we had just been driving down the highway where all the signs are in Welsh, right? And the schools or the the girl that the the family farm family that was renting us the farm we were staying on, um, their daughter was learning in Welsh. It was a Welsh only like like in Quebec where it's French only schools. Yeah. They had Welsh only, you know, like Welsh first language schools and English was a second language and all this. So we're going, well, that's amazing. How did this happen? Like if they couldn't speak their own language on pain of, you know, horrible things happening to them and they weren't allowed in the, their own towns and things like that for that many years. How did they come back with this, you know, their language is back again and all of that, right? So I had to find out more about that. And we went up onto the battlements and we were looking around. And according to the placards, that area had been invaded in 1282 by the English. And there were um, in the surrounding countryside, 3, somewhere between 3,000 to 10,000 English troops descended upon that castle and basically took it. And um, we, so up on the battlements, we were looking out and I, I mean, you know, just looking at it, one of the interesting things was that was, that was apparently the first time that anyone is recorded using camouflage because Edward the first wife um, and, and ladies, I guess they created all these white cloaks to put around the troops so that they could sneak up the hill in the snow, you know, and I know snow, right? <laughs> I'm from Saskatchewan. So snow is a very from common Canada, thing. No snow. Yeah. Well, this was May, so there was no snow on the ground, but we were looking out and I could imagine that. I could imagine those mountains, the, the long, long hillside of the mountain, you know, sloping down, um, being covered with snow and all these troops descending upon them and looking out and suddenly seeing all these troops you know like wow well, scary would that be right this is not a big castle it's quite little you know yeah. i mean it's tall but it's quite it's like and you'd have, just have your guys in there with you you know your family their families their wife kids whatever you know not um they they were technologically outmatched by, by the english the english were way more technologically advanced in their armor and their, you know, fighting and everything, everything than the Welsh were. The Welsh were fierce and ferocious, but, you know, um, more, more, more like farmers, like rural, you know, and everybody fought. You know, there wasn't really, a, there were, there were knights and, you know, well-trained guys for sure. Well-trained, uh, both men and women that were fight, were able to fight, but not many of them. It's a small country, right? And uh, just looking at that going, oh, my gosh, what would that have been like? And I just had to write about it. That's I, I came home and spent the next 10 years trying to write these stories because, you know, it just struck me. I'm actually writing the third one now. There's two out already, um, but I'm working on the third one now about surviving that. Because what interests me is not so much the war itself. You know, uh, there's information about battles and things like that. But given that I'm from a farming area and that this was a rural kind of farming country, you know, um, I, I was interested in how they survived, like how, and how you could keep your language intact. My grandfather had apparently told my father and he told me stories about how um, the Welsh, in his opinion, invented guerrilla warfare and, you know, and kept the language going kind of underground in the mountains of, of North Wales for, you know, uh, to pass down. My grandfather was a Welsh speaker with quite an accent, I guess. So he really was a Welsh first speaker. Um, not that I ever met him, but these are the stories that come to you, you know, if you start asking people about, um, about, you know, people who are no longer with you and the stories you get are quite interesting. But uh, anyway, um, that interested me. How did they get through it? How did they survive it? So the stories that I'm telling are, I'm using fantasy, I'm using Welsh legends and Welsh mythology. And basically, 
I have two siblings who have magical abilities and they, they use their magical abilities to help their people survive the invasion of Wales and the war that lost, basically where they lost everything. They lost their country, they lost, they lost their language, they lost their system of law, you know, and everything. But they somehow survived it and 800 years later were able to bring the language back pretty much intact, as I understand it, the way it was spoken in the 1200s. So that's pretty interesting, you know, that you could kind of have that ability to just hang on to your traditions for that long um, in, a, in such a way as to re, reinvigorate them when the time comes, you know, and you get your freedom again. So, and, which was, I guess, in the 1990s in Wales, you know, really they, they had an independence movement in the 1900s earlier on, but, uh, but it really gained um, the ability to speak their language and to have the schools in their language in the 1990s. So, you know, quite a, quite a, quite a uh, reinstatement, I guess you could say, of language and culture going on there, which I just thought was really fascinating. And something that, you know, is very topical in other, in other countries and other cultures today. There's still horrible wars going on and genocide and everything, you know, like um, I think this yeah. story, how they got through it is, um, gives me a lot of faith in, in how we as a people are going to survive our century, you know. Um, so that's mainly how it all came so about. So Marie, in the books, are, do you write in English or do you uh, write in Welsh? Uh, well, like yeah, I had to actually take a couple of Welsh classes because I wanted to use some Welsh, given that my grandfather was a Welsh speaker and that I think that reinsurgence of language is really important, especially as an ESL teacher. You know, um, I want, I, I look at, her, my students all have heritage languages of different kinds. I have students from all countries, you know, um, who are newcomers to Canada trying to beef up their English basically in my classes and uh, you know that but that sense of speaking heritage languages I think is very very important and keeping language alive in general I think is very important um, English is a conglomeration of a bunch of different languages you know it's it's not a thing that existed on its own yeah. it, it grew out of trade and and um, you know usage basically and so that kind of I thought I found was interesting. So I took a couple of Welsh classes and I have, I had a, a Welsh teacher. Uh, my Welsh teacher was a, a, an early reader for Spirit Sight and helped me out with uh, using different languages and things like that. And I have had other Welsh speakers over the course of events. So I do try and use a bit of Welsh here and there, but I have, um, I, I did a glossary of the terms and a glossary of the names um, or a, I guess a, table of contents of the names um, character list, you know, that, that explains how to say the words. So I've got the, the pronunciation guide in with them and with a lot of the castle names as well, because they're, they look, they look like they're hard to say, but they're not really once you get the gist of it, you know. Um, anyway, it's like, I, I wanted that to be part of it. But no, they're written in English, but, but there is a few Welsh words uh, strategically placed here and there and that sense of language is kind of part of it you know that that um for example the the two siblings one's a boy and one's a girl and the girl speaks less fluently in english than the boy does you know things like that so that they have their their sort of language tie-ins i guess with it and yeah. yeah so that's that's part of what you know i was looking at Plus I wanted to, there's gaps in the research because after the war, um, Edward had, Edward I Longshanks, right? Was the, was the King of England at the time. Um, he really, he, his proclamation after he won basically said he had exterminated the Welsh, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> By which, yeah, I mean, you know, he was, he was not a, not a fan of the Welsh in any sense, but he, um, he basically burned a lot of the Welsh documents and, you know, records from the war and records from before the war and records of the last Prince of Wales. So there really wasn't a lot um, kept, you know, that would make him look good. There was a sense too in um, over time, like in the early 1900s, um, places in England that would have been in charge of education were very down on Llewellyn that, Ap Griffith, the, the last true Prince of Wales. Um, he he was not considered to be a good person and this, that, and the next thing. And there's um, there's a sense that one shouldn't look even 
at his, you know, to find information about him. And that changes over the century so that now we actually have quite a bit of really interesting information. But if there's a sense like he, he brought the country together for the first and only time in its history for about 10 or 15 years, he, mm -hmm. he ran things as a unified whole for the first time in the history of Wales. And then they lost that. <laughs> Edward attacked a couple of times and basically um, pushed him back into Gwynedd and North Wales and the, the Llyn Peninsula, where um, the where I took my Welsh language classes, basically, where they have been, you know, the keepers of the Welsh language and culture. And um, the, the gaps in that research were really attractive to me as a writer because I could fill them with, and especially with magic and legends, right? It's kind of like magic realism in a sense that when you are not allowed to speak about things, you create stories about that. And, uh, you know, so there was a written Welsh language. There were several books written in, in, in Welsh, but um, there's this sort of mythology about the, the Welsh that they're a very oral culture because yeah. they had to be, right? Because after their records were destroyed, the only way you could get that from one generation to another was to tell a bunch of stories. So um, a lot of those stories, I think, serve that purpose. So I'm looking at the, at the legends and the stories as um, ideas about the solution, right? For example, Edward took um, the royal seals of the Welsh royal, or not royal, the, they're actually, in, the Prince of Wales is actually the first citizen of Wales. He's not royal in that sense, in the sense that the English monarchs were considered to be royalty. But uh, they had seals, you know, like um, where you would seal a document with your... Uh, oh, with like, the wax. With your that, emblem. Right? Yeah. yeah. With your, so that kind of thing. And they he, basically Edward took those and he had them melted down and, and uh, made into a chalice, which is a cup kind of that you would use in a church and he donated it to one of the churches and it kind of got lost. Who knows where it is, right? So I could use that, right? And I could think about um, what if, the other thing is my family, the Powell family, one of our, um, which is like one of the backgrounds, I guess, the family lore that comes down to you is that we are the keepers of the chalice. And I always thought that was kind of mythologically referring to, um, you know, the chalice of Christ, right? The the Last Supper and all of that, the, the Holy Grail that the Templars had and all, you know, that kind of legend. But it dawned on me as I was reading this that the chalice might have been, you know, what if what if at some point the Welsh had stolen it back and not actually told anybody, <laughs> but used this sort of Christian myth of the Holy Grail as a way of saying, guess what? We have it back. <laughs> we have the chalice. We are the keepers. So that's what I kind of worked with in the story. Ways of, of using the sort of lore and the magic to read between the lines of history. History being kept by the people who won the war, not the people who yeah. lost the war. But I'm writing about the people who lost, right? And yeah. how they survived afterwards. So that was the fun part for me in writing these novels. And I think it kind of is what took me so long, partly because I was waiting for the research as people were doing it. I'm not a historian myself, right? I think I'm a pretty good researcher, but I'm not uh, trained in history in that way. And I don't have degrees in history. Um, you know, I have degrees in theater and degrees in writing, right? And journalism, things like that. So so that was the fun part for me in the writing. Of well, it, and it I, goes right, it, it, Marie goes right to your tea, right? Because your yep. tea that you gave me was respect, explore, and attitude, lifelong learnings. And yep. it's all about the story of your family and the history of Welch. Yeah. And how you can use that, right? How you can use those um, in reading between the lines, exploring the possibilities, you know, is how, um, how sometimes you can get some really good ideas for novels. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I, I want to get into the word respect. Why'd you give me the word respect for? I think it's really important. That's the number one rule in my, uh, when I'm talking to all of, whether I, whatever I'm teaching, uh, the number one rule is that we respect each other in the room, right? That everybody here is entitled. Everybody here is equal. And we all have something to say, you know, and to offer each other and we can all learn from each other. 
So the word tolerance is is a lovely word, right? I think, but it's not quite hard and like it's not quite uh, proactive enough. You know, yeah. tolerance kind of implies sort of a passive sense, but I think respect. To if you're going to re offer someone respect, they don't have to earn it. You know, we all get respect just for the fact that we are alive at this time. Yeah. We're trying to, we're all struggling. We're all in the same struggle, trying to get through. And um, so I think actively respecting each other as much as we can, reminding ourselves sometimes to respect each other, you know, right, uh, well, is really, it, really important. Like said, Marie, like, you know, respect is in, not earned, right? It's That's right. We're, I don't think, I hear stupid. people say that all the time, you know, if you want me to respect you, you have to earn it. Like, yeah, I, I don't believe in that. I think, you know, just being alive today, you deserve some respect. You know, if you've managed to make it to whatever age you're at at this moment, you deserve respect for that. And I think that, like I said, the more you effort you put into working at respecting other people, the easier it gets and the better you live in the long run, you know, yeah. the better your life is, I think. Yeah. So Marie, how much exploring did you do for these books? A lot. <laughs> I've got, I've got all over the place. I kind of figured that because yeah. I was, your second word was explore and, I, and just listening to you about the castles and everything, you had to yeah. explore the castles, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I learn that way. I'm, I'm kind of a kinesthetic learner in the sense that I like to walk the walk, you know, like um, one of the things that drew me to Wales was the fact that I wanted to know more about my grandfather. And um, I had the sense of, okay, I mean, he's been dead for a long time. He's, he left Wales a long time ago. And um, in my family, there was this sense that he had sort of said, um, you know, don't don't go visit Wales. It's all slag heaps, and you know they've destroyed the country and blah blah. And so we've moved to Canada, right? But I thought I just wanted to go and walk the walk and see what he saw. And when I got there, I was amazed. Like they have reclaimed the entire environment and you know cleaned things up in an amazing way. Like another good lesson for you know uh, when we're talking in Canada about our our sort of uh, you know attempts to restore the environment and think about the environment and climate change and all of that. I think that's a really good lesson too, to see yeah. what's been done in, in some other countries, especially given what my grandfather had said and what I saw when I went there in person being so start strikingly different, you know, um, because they have really cleaned up a lot of the areas that he was talking about. And I was amazed by that as well. So, I mean, I think I get a lot out of that. I, I, can walk in an area and like I said, get up on the battlements and look out and imagine what might have happened in a in a, a historical situation. That feeds my creative brain, you know? Not everybody needs to do that by any stretch. People can explore in a lot of different ways. You can sit in your armchair and read a book and get all kinds of ideas like that too, right? Yes. But for me, the combination of those things and then being able to actually walk around in the area and see things and smell and hear and, you know, just, feel like you get a sense of what the remoteness of the country is because you think like the population of these countries is often bigger than the population of Canada you know but when you actually get there and you see the spaces where people are and the spaces where people are not and yeah. the the spaces where the, the Welsh were actually living in that time period where there aren't big cities the big cities are down the road you know where where they felt it was better to have a big city, but the Welsh had their main cities in quite remote rural areas, you know, and, and traveled around to those areas quite a bit in the 1200s. So putting that together in my head helps me a lot. It, it, it helps me to explore physically as well as mentally, you know, because when you're reading, you're exploring kind of mentally and with your imagination, which is important too, you know, I use that as well. But for me to get out in the area and actually kind of walk around in, in other people's shoes, so to speak. That's what I like. That's what what helps me creatively. Yeah, I like going into the history, like old buildings and museums, yeah. because I can feel the energy, or you know, like yeah, I can picture how they would have sat at the table, the conversations they would have had, all of those things, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, your last one that you gave me was attitude, life of lifelong life learning. learning. Yeah, yeah. lifelong learning. Yes. So, what's that all about, there, Marie? Well, you know, um, 
I still take classes, right? I mean, I've got 40 some books, you know, 46, I think now, uh, counting these two and the ones I'm writing now will be, I'll be up to 50, hopefully by someday soon. Um, but basically, I still take classes too, as well as teach classes, you know, um, I learn from my students, but I also take classes from people I think are excellent writers or just who have something interesting to say that I want to hear. Uh, I don't think your learning has to stop when you leave high school or leave elementary school or whatever. I think you can learn in a lot of different ways. And I think you can learn, like I'm 66 now, you know, and I'm still taking classes. So uh, I think you can learn right up till the time when you're, you know, 80 or beyond, right? Or I'm 101. I imagine you could take a class then too. You're just learning at 80. That's what my grandma used to tell me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I think it's important to keep learning. I think that keeps us keeps us mentally fit too, in a, in a way, you know, like it's a different process. We, it's good to teach, I think. If you, if you have a skill, it's good to teach that skill because you learn a lot about the skill as you're teaching it and as you're seeing different people using it, you know. But, um, but it's also good, I think, sometimes to let yourself be the learner, you know, go back into that process. And it, it makes you more, um, uh, you know, sympathetic or whatever. It makes you more aware of what learners need too, I think, which is useful. Yeah. Well, see, and I told you your tea would make sense to you Thank when we you got it out there. there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Marie, if anybody would like to know more about these books, because like, where could they find these books? And it's can, the third book that's out now, right? I haven't got it out yet. Yeah. I'm still oh, working okay. on it. Yeah, it's going to take me a little bit more time, but, you know, it's coming along. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, basically my website is a good place to look. Um, I have links to my website on Facebook and my social media too. But I think uh, on the one page of my website, I have the books all listed, you know, and there's a, a section for children's books and a section for uh, the young adult books, which is growing all the time. I'm hoping to make it bigger all the time as I write more of them. But, uh, but yeah, I would, I would recommend my website. And you have some workshops, I believe that you do as well. Correct? That's right. Yeah. And I have a page on my website for workshops as well. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I'm on Goodreads and I'm on, um, I have an author central on Amazon. I've, I'm in all the usual places and my books are all over the place, like on Amazon and in the bookstores. And, you know, you can order them from the bookstore. Sometimes you don't find them physically in the bookstore, but, uh, but they will be able to order them because they're available anywhere. So Marie, are your workshops only in person or are they virtual as well? No, I do a lot of virtual. I, in fact, I'm teaching my um, CLB, my Canadian language benchmark class in, uh, completely online these days. Um, yeah, I do a lot of online workshops. Uh, I did one for the Saskatchewan Writers Guild in um, March actually, uh, but I also um, have been the virtual writer in residence. So I've done a writer, uh, like a residency online where for the, um, writers who are in rural areas of Saskatchewan um, because that's Saskatchewan is big enough that it would take you a few hours to get from one, you know, from the North to the South or vice versa. So it makes sense for us to be online. And I use zoom mostly for, you know, giving workshops and classes. And I've done workshops for schools where I've gone in um, in person and I've done workshops for schools where I've gone in on zoom and done it that way. And I'm happy to do either. Yeah, I think they're both really valid, different, but valid. Yeah. So Marie, you gave me the word persistent when I asked you to give me a word mm. to describe yourself. Why that word? Um, well, I, I'm i not, I'm, I'm one of those people that just keeps at things, you know, like if, if I persist long enough, uh, many things, many things happen. I get success in the end, right? But also, um, you know, if you make a mistake and you persist long enough, you can outlive your own mistakes, which is kind of nice. And also, uh, like I said, just just that I, I people sometimes say, how did you get 46 books published? You know, well, you just keep doing it. You know, <laughs> like you, yeah. you don't let things stop you. You just keep doing it and you get better and better. You know, that's my hope anyway. <laughs> so what final message do you have for everybody tonight? Just, you know, I think it's really important to believe in yourself. And I think it's really important to um, remember that you are the bottom line, right? If you believe you can do something, then just keep keep on until you learn how to do it as best you can, you know? 
And also, if you want to be a writer, I would say read, definitely. And even if you don't want to be a writer, read anyway, because it's fun, right? But but basically, yeah, just believe in yourself, because nobody else is going to if you don't. You know? So, Marie, do you want to just read out your uh, e uh, your website for the audio listeners? Oh, sure. Let me think. <laughs> so, basically, it's mariepowell.ca. So, if you can remember my name, you can find me online. Um, Marie Powell, M-A-R-I-E-P-O-W-E-L-L dot C-A for Canada. Marie Powell from Canada. That's who I am. There you go. Well, it was a pleasure having you, Marie, with me tonight and sharing your tea. Uh, I always enjoy these history stories because I love history. Uh, so be sure to go out and grab a book. Check her out. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to her, uh, check out uh, Creative Edge, Mickey Mickelson, uh, and he'll hook you up like he hooked me up. And yeah. we'll, we will be back next week, same time, same place. And we're going to serve tea all over again, but a different TEA for each one because we do storytelling and words in Miss Liz's house. So until then, I'm going to wish you guys all a beautiful weekend. Make sure to take time for your family and friends. And we'll see you all next week, same time, same place. And we'll serve you another cup of tea then. <laughs>